Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to another episode of the e-commerce marketing show. Uh, my guest today is Eric Banholtz from Beard Brand. Hey, Eric. Hey, man. What's going on? All right. So I have seen your name everywhere. So my, I like, I spent the last decade in B2B marketing and then being at Privy as a CMO has been my first real like entrance into e-commerce and everybody before I even DM'd you, I think you posted something on Twitter about like, you want to do more podcasts. And I was like, shoot, I got to DM this guy. Cause I seen, I've seen your stuff everywhere. Everybody has talked about the brand you've built and, you know, building that through YouTube. So I'm, I'm excited to chat and I hope, I hope you're not, you know, personally offended that I'm, I'm, I'm not the greatest fit for your target demo, but I think we'll be okay. I don't know, man. We go after men. You're a man, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. You're right. You're right. Okay. I think, I think we can work on that. Yeah, so yeah. Give me, give me some, uh, like if, if you could take us all the way back to, uh, 2012, like how, how did you, how did you start this, this brand? Where did it start? Yeah. So the, the journey actually starts, of course, like any good business, uh, before the business started, I used to be a financial advisor at a mega bank and, uh, they kind of like pressure you to, to look and act and behave a certain way, which as you would probably imagine, especially back in 2010, 2011 was no facial hair. Um, so I quit working there and I uh, decided to grow my beard out. And during this process, I also decided to, to start up another business, like a marketing consulting business. And, uh, in that process, I would go to networking events. People would call me ZZ top or duck dynasty or grizzly Adams. And like, those are cool dudes. Like I got no beef with them, but I got like some of the softest hands you can imagine. Like <laughs> I'm a keyboard warrior. Uh, I love being indoors. And I did not fit like those traditional stereotypes at all. So what happened is I ended up um, growing my beard pretty long and went to this event with other bearded guys. And I started to realize that there's a whole community of guys who are similar to me, uh, other like, you know, stay at home dads, entrepreneurs, doctors, lawyers, salespeople, uh, a community that we ended up coining the term urban beardsmen to describe. So uh, it was my goal in 2012, the beginning of 2012, to unite urban beardsmen and really give them the tools they needed to feel confident about their beard, feel confident about their style, you know, how to, how to grow. And ultimately, you know, kind of going back to, to the start of the conversation, we want to help guys um, become the best version of themselves, you know, beard or no beard. You know, like we're not heavy on, on pushing the growth of beard, even though it is in our name. So did you have... Did you have like a product idea or did this start as like community first? Like you started to build, you know, content and community around it. Yeah. The, the goal was always, you know, kind of a, an extension of what I was going through as an individual and, and kind of just being uh, like the extrovert that I am just talking about my problems and sharing that and, and trying to help and connect with other people who were dealing with the same issues. I, uh, had when I had the vision for beard brand uh, in the early days, the vision was actually like a like a Lululemon or a Vans. It was like a lifestyle company, so it was like pants and shirts and accessories and whatever an urban beardsman would would need to define their style. Um, but in like true like lack of competence uh, that I have, I had no idea how to make clothes <laughs> or accessories. So. Uh, we're, we, we started by reselling, uh, grooming products and, uh, we, so we weren't even manufacturing grooming products and those just like kind of sold like hotcakes. And, uh, so we tried to like over time, like we even developed our own custom made shirts and we had suspenders and we had, you know, wallets and these bracelets and all these other things that were trying to go with my original, um, vision. And it just, none of them worked. Like none of those early products worked the grooming products really work. So that's when we shifted our focus. I mean, we didn't really shift the focus, but we just cut, cut all the distractions and just focused on grooming products and making the best grooming products that we could. But like the first product that you had, did you, you, you bought that and resold it from somewhere. So it wasn't like the most legendary, like people didn't buy it because it was brand new and groundbreaking. They bought it because they were, it was associated to this like, this guy who's selling this stuff, he speaks to me. There's a movement around this. Yeah, you know, um, you'd have to ask those early customers uh, why they bought. We, the, the the company, the products that we're selling in the early days, the first year, um, 
that company was also brand new as well. So there was like, no, it wasn't like a Gillette or Old Spice or something that we're selling. Uh, so it was, it, I mean, it was beard oil. And in 2013, when we launched our e-commerce store, like no one had heard of beard oil, like no one knew what it was for. And um, we had this product uh, that we we're selling and then we developed our own product and launched that in May and gradually just kind of like grew our line and eventually phased out. Uh, all the products that we're reselling. What What did you have from a store? Like, what was the e-commerce world like in in 2013? Like, what did you have to set up and and build that on? It's a good question. Yes, because before Beard Brand, I've got a whole like wake of failed businesses, and one of them was a, another failed e-commerce business called Wakamo. W a k o m o. I uh, I had two sales on that store. We were selling vinyl wall graphics. So like, uh, you know, nowadays it's all like inspirational text and stuff, but I had like trees and birds and you could just kind of build your own little uh, scene. And um, you would have crushed it. You would have crushed it instead of Zoom backgrounds during COVID. You guys would have been, you know, you could have sold all the wall wraps for everybody. I know, man. I know. It was just a little too early. Just like, a, you know, 12 years too early. Uh, we... Uh, we were built on Magento. So like, I'm kind of a self-taught designer. I'm like a tech guy. Again, I got those soft hands. They're meant for keyboards. Uh, so uh, I built the website because it was cheap. It was like $30 hosting or whatever. And that was like pretty much your only option that and like OS commerce back in 2008. Um, but in like going to these networking events, I talked to someone else who was selling subway tiles. He's like, yeah, dude, just go on Shopify. Like, don't, don't be, uh, your value add is not your ability to to be on the platform. Your value add is like your, your, your message and whatnot. So I was like, yeah, like I know I'm giving up some stuff by being on Shopify back in 2013, but it's easy and we'll just go with it. And then we'll focus on our story and that stuff, which was probably, you know, one of the better decisions we made uh, being on that platform. What was the, like, do you have a, do you have a team? I'm assuming you have a team now. Um, what did, who did, who did the marketing, like manage day-to-day site, you know, worked on website conversion. Like what did you guys do on, on the store? Yeah. So we're an entirely bootstrap company. Um, and starting the company, I convinced, uh, Lindsay and Jeremy, my business partners to come, you know, come work on the project with me. Uh, beard brand was in that first year, especially the first, uh, seven or eight months. It was pretty much me working on it first as like a part-time thing. And then I, I phased out that, that marketing consulting business. I was making like $1,000 a month or $2,000. No, I wasn't making any money on that. Uh, so I phased that out and then started fin- spending more and more time on Beard Brand. And in those early days, I did everything, customer service, marketing, you know, product development, uh, operations, uh, of course, with the help of my business partners, Lindsay and Jeremy. Um, but that was always like a side project uh, for them as well. So I was kind of the one running the ship. And then um, the first hire we made was, I think, in like October or, or November uh, of that year. So we launched in January. And then like nine or 10 months later, I made my hire who, who helped with customer service. But we're not like, um, we're, since we're bootstrapped, uh, we've always had more time than money. Um, we always did things that were just kind of like time oriented. So a lot of social media, a lot of interactions, a lot of telling stories on YouTube. Uh, that we did. And, and really it's, um, there, there, we don't come, we, we didn't build this business as how I would imagine a lot of entrepreneurs do where it's, uh, you know, Oh, here's an opportunity in the marketplace. And if I just make this, you know, and I cut out the middleman and I got like, whatever, you know, D to C buzzwords that are going on with like, we're the new, uh, you know, fancy keychain or whatever. Um, so it was more of just like being able to express my passion for, uh, the community and for facial hair, uh, and grooming and self-investment, you know, and and that's when you're able to kind of talk about passion, it's, it's not about like conversion rate and it's not about, um, you know, like demographics of your audience and how you're targeting things. It's just about how can you spread what you're passionate about to as many people as possible. I think I love that because I think that comes, it comes through in your marketing, right? Which is like, you have, it's all clearly community first. It's almost like, I almost feel like your YouTube content 
could exist on its own, even if you you weren't the guy selling a product on the back end. Yeah, I mean, it's um, our, our YouTube channel. We have two of them now. Um, we really just focus on how do we bring value uh, to our audience. And we kind of, um, I mean, we're not Buddhists, but we kind of do believe in like the whole karma stuff. Like if you do good things, then good things will come back to you. Uh, so if we, we serve our audience and we serve our customers, then, you know, hopefully they return the favor. And if they don't, that's their prerogative as well. We, we don't get upset with them about that. So we don't feel, we never feel entitled to anyone's business. So we're always very grateful uh, for any business that, that someone chooses to, to send a beard brand. So did you like, did you ever set out and do any like intentional marketing? Like was there, all right, February, 2013, this is a launch day. Hey girl. Um, <laughs> this is, this is our, this is our launch day and we're going to send out an email and there's going to be ads in this offer. Like, or, 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 <laughs> we're getting really good at this. I know the feeling. I know the feeling. It's happened to me too. I don't even care anymore. It's like, it is what it, this is. This is how we do it. She gets, it's actually worse if I try to fight it and I'm like, Hey, you can't be in here. That's when it gets way, way worse. And so it's like, more. um, so like, did you ever do, did you do an intentional marketing? Like, Hey, 20% off. Here's our first, you know, we're launching. Here's a landing page. There's a countdown timer. Is it all organic? No, we are, we're, we're certainly, um, we're certain very strategic. One of the things that we've done really well at Beard Brand, and I think attributes to a lot of our success is one, we're very philosophical and we, we run our organization based on our core values, which are freedom, hunger, and trust. And the other thing is, you know, we're, we're guided by our mission as kind of the, giving us the direction on what to work with. And then m most importantly, me and my, business partners, we meet every quarter to step outside of the day-to-day -day business and kind of focus on the strategy of the business and, and how we're going to grow. So we think about like, what is the strategic plan for growing Beard Brand? How we're going to do it? How are we going to put our um, limited resources? Because the reality is like every single company out there, 100% of companies, everything from, you know, Amazon uh, down to the someone who's just starting up today has scarce resources. There's more that you want to do than you have the, the resources to do. So uh, to be successful in business, you have to figure out how you prioritize your limited resources, whether that be time or money. And uh, businesses that are successful are really good at that prioritization and figuring things out. So, um, you know, we, we've, in the early days, it was about learning. So we tried as many things as possible to learn as quickly as possible. Uh, and then we would cut off the things that weren't working. So like I said, we were selling suspenders and wallets and, you know, button up shirts and, you know, of course, grooming products. And we were, you know, we were using uh, ad roll and we were using Facebook marketing and we were selling on Amazon and we were, you know, we were trying everything. And it's through that, that trying that you're able to kind of test. And, and the beauty in the early days is like, if you cut something or you end something, uh, whether it be products, like you only have like, you know, a hundred customers or a thousand customers or whatever it is, like you're not pissing off tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. Um, so in those early days, you really want to try to break stuff as quickly as possible and then make those adjustments because the future is where you're getting your hundreds of thousands of customers. And that's when you want to have stuff figured out. Um, so that was kind of like our strategy in those early days. I'm scribbling down notes and quotes because I think this is a really important this is an important topic for, I think, I think marketing. So like we're, we're focusing specifically on marketing through our content at, at Privy in this podcast, right? Um, that's the, that's the hardest part is like you get overwhelmed with there is, um, okay. There's, there's YouTube, there's Instagram, there's Snapchat, there's email, there's uh, user generated content, there's reviews, there's Shopify, there's this theme, there's that theme. Like you can see how, especially if you're not a marketing person, you're like, holy shit, like, I don't even know what to start. I'm not good at any of those things. I've never made a video in my life. And I think like the thing that you seem super aware of is like, A, you were bootstrapped. So like, that's a pretty good forcing function, right? And, and B, like if you, you use your strength, like it seems like you're, you're an extrovert, you're natural, you're, you're a natural, natural communicator and, and educator. And so like, I was looking at, if I go back and watch some of your early YouTube videos, 
even some of your highest viewed YouTube videos are you just walking down the street with an, with an iPhone. And I think that that's, that was clearly like a strength that you identified. Like, okay, this is easy for me to do. Cause I think a lot of, a lot of marketing is like, if it's not any, anything in life, if it's not natural to you, you're not going to want to do it. And yeah, that's, that's, a, that's the beauty of building a business is you get to build it the way that you want. And really it's find the things that you think you can be doing for five or 10 years because you're going to burn out. Like you're going to get tired of it. And if you don't enjoy it, like if, if you listen to this podcast and you're like, Oh, beard brand is really good on, on YouTube. And they, they made millions of dollars on YouTube. Let's go do to YouTube. And it's like, well, I hate being in front of the camera. You know, I get nervous. I can't script. Like I, I just, I, I don't know how to edit videos. Like you're, 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 you're just going to be miserable. Um, but if you like data, you know, like maybe sell on Amazon. That's a great place to go where you can really take advantage of your data. If you like writing, you know, blogging is still an excellent op- opportunity or email marketing, you know, like there's so many, so many skill sets that you, you have available that you can execute on and build an amazing successful business. And in those early days, you have scarce resources. So do the things that you really enjoy doing. And then as you grow, you can hire people who are good at the other things and like capture that market but you don't have to do it all on day one. Yeah. So, so like my guess is your YouTube, your YouTube, like I can't imagine you're the one in there editing YouTube videos anymore. Yeah. Fortunately not. Uh, that was, uh, I think it was like 2016 that I started to hand over, uh, the video editing. So really I, I did it for, for three years. How, how, how was that? Cause I think a lot of like a lot of entrepreneurs are type A, you want to do it yourself. You know, that's your thing. I yeah. got to stay close. I got to stay close to the brand. This is my baby. I'm the only one who can know the tone of voice. Like how, how did you actually do that? Especially you, you did it for, it's not like you just did it for a month. You did it for two or three years. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the thing is I'm not a very good editor. Like it's, uh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm not passionate. Like I, I, I geeked out on it a little bit and, and, you know, I learned a lot. It was fun to learn. Um, but video editing is, is not something I really enjoy. Uh, I do enjoy design. I do enjoy telling a story, but like setting up the lights and the camera and um, like, I, I like the start of it, but not the, the maintenance of it. So, um, but at the same time, when you have no money, you just you have to do what you have to do to, to get it done. So for me, I think there are certain things that were really hard for me to part with. Uh, and continue to be hard. Like I'm still involved in product development, um, you know, testing the products, making sure the products uh, meet our standards. And that there's something that personally I enjoy using because I, I really don't want to sell products that I don't like using. Um, and then, uh, you know, the brand voice, like I, it took me a long time to do that. I used to review like every email that went, went out. So I would like rewrite all the emails and, uh, you know, the thing that makes it easier is, is when you really hire team members who align with the brand perfectly and they're out there. Um, but it took us, you know, what, what years of 2020, it took us, uh, literally like eight years to finally build a team where, um, not only do we have excellent team members, we we've always had excellent team members, but team members who like really closely align with the brand and can, can thrive, uh, being left to their own devices with the brand. And has that, has that come because like, does that just take time or did you make hiring mistakes and now you know the profile? Like how, how do you get better at that? Yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, we were terrible. Uh, we were terrible at two things, uh, hiring and, um, managing. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> as most, as most entrepreneurs are <laughs> like, but, uh, yeah, you're, you're trying to start the fire. Like, <laughs> But we, we recognize that it was a problem for us. And, and b- business is just simply a series of problems that you have to solve. So it's like, what's the next problem we have to solve? Well, we, we're, we're having trouble with our, our team running smoothly. So um, we in- integrated um, uh, the hiring process, which is called top grading. And kind of the 30-second pitch is at every step of the, the hiring process, you tell your candidates that you're going to do a reference check. Uh, with the person you're asking questions about. So it kind of, um, first of all, during the, the, the early phases, it screens out all your, your C and D players who, who won't be able to have a positive reference. And then two, it, 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 it's like a true serum. Like when we call up John Doe and ask him about you, what is he going to say? 
Um, so they can't really bullshit. They know how John Doe is going to say it. And if, if that doesn't mesh, then, you know, there's certainly red flags. And then you do the reference check at the end. So that's been a really good step. And, and by the end of the process, we, we pretty much know if someone's going to be a good fit. And where the mistake always ends up, and we still do it to a certain degree, is like where we say, well, you know, they're, they're nine, 90 percent of the way there. And, you know, if, if they don't fit out, we can always let them go. It's like, well, if you're saying that when you're hiring someone, just don't, don't hire them. Because the, the team members who we hired uh, where we're just like, yeah, I love this guy. I can't wait for them to start. They check all the boxes. Those people come in and then they, they crush it. Uh, and you never have 100% hit rate with your team members. But we finally, uh, like, for instance, I mean, the, the entire team at Beard Brand right now is, is crushing it. And, uh, but I want to call it, like, because it's the most visible, our copywriter like if you read our emails right now, like I'm not proofing any emails. I'm not uh, giving any kind of inspiration or ideation, anything. Um, he's in doing it entirely himself. And it's just like a hundred percent on brand and it's fun. And it's like our voice. And it's just like, um, it, it's like, I can see how it scales so quickly because he's in a great spot too, because he doesn't have to worry about, you know, getting an approval from his boss or making all these changes. He just gets to write the way that he wants to write, which happens to be in line with our brand. It's funny because I have a bunch of prep notes in a Google doc and it, that Lauren had written and it says, ask him about their emails because their emails are fire emoji. And uh, that has to feel good. Like, especially if it's not you that's writing it, it's like you have this superpower now and like you can, you can just apply that person. You can say, Hey, we're going to do an event. Can you write the copy for the event page? And you know, it's going to be awesome. Hey, we're going to do a special launch for, you know, Black Friday, Cyber Monday. Can you write the copy for that? And you, you know that it's actually going to be better than you would have done, not knowing, not just worrying about like, is it going to be good enough? Yeah. And, and um, the other interesting thing about that candidate, and, and maybe this is guides or advice for, for people, like we place a lot of value uh, again, in our core values, freedom, hunger, and trust. So that's higher than the skill level. And then the second thing is like uh, the person in that role, he, he, he was never a copywriter before working at Beard Brain. So like he, um, we kind of like just uh, trust is one of our core values. And when they show passion and interest, and of course, like his writing up to that point and like the, the sample writings that he did, clearly he was, he was a talented writer. Um, so how, how, hiring a copywriter is very hard on its own. Hiring a copywriter who's not a copywriter is hard. How, how I'm just curious because a lot of people will get stuck here. How did you like? What was the hiring process for actually finding a copywriter? Yeah, I mean, so um, you have the job listing. Uh, one of the things that we do uh, with all candidates, um, in as a segue, if you ever have um, two candidates who you're considering and they're pretty equally weighted, always hire the one who's a better communicator. Um, and so of course, written communication is a, an important factor. And one of the first screening processes of our interview process is, you know, freedom, hunger, and trust are Beard Brand's core values. Please write about what those core values mean to you. And then we start to see like their writing skills and talents. And and you can see who's going to be like, oh, sh shit, I just got to fill this out so I can get through this interview process first. Like who actually, it's easy to write about if you believe that and live that. Yeah. And, and not only that, like in the hiring process for copywriter, we had like, you know, do a product description. And a lot of writers are just very sterile. And they're like, oh, you know, like I took English lit and I got proper grammar. And it's like, oh, and this product is a great product because it does this, this, and this. Whereas like for us and our brand and our voice, it's like, dude, like smack some bitches around. and like Yeah, here, I'll read it. This is from the welcome email. Let's get you started right. Congrats, man. You're about to begin our beard brand boot camp. Check uh, chock full of killer grooming tips, support, and inspirations. But before that happens, we want to book you up with an exclusive 12 piece four vices starter bundle. The bundle is so exclusive that you can't even find it on our website. What's in the bundle? Everything you need to groom like a boss. Yeah, it's, it's great copy. And clearly that's written um, for, for a very clear persona. Yeah, I mean, I, like that's not even like, uh, we did a, a product launch for, uh, it was a molten, molten lava uh, comb, which is like the design of our comb. And um, it's, it's really, it's, it's, 
It's great. So let me read this one um, just because I'm really proud of, uh, let me see. I hope this is it. Okay. Uh, so Mike loves puns. The title was These Combs Are Combusting. And, uh, oh man, I, I, you, you guys, you just got to subscribe to the Beer Brand Newsletter because, like, like the, Go, go. That, that's the best thing. Like, like just like our campaign, like, so those are the flow emails. Um, but our campaigns, like whenever we have a, a product launch, um, what was he doing? He was, yeah, he was doing like a, how many words can he find that have comb in it? So the molten lava one is for starters, no comb combats your beard better. The hand cut cellulose acetate is smoother than a 15 move combo immortal combat. We're talking flawless victories over beard tangles. Second, the beard brand combs leave your beard feeling as healthy as you can when you drink kumbacha. We push uh, more like kumbacha. Uh, so anyways, you, you kind of get the, and I don't think like most people will catch that, but like those who like really, uh, really do, they'll, they'll put a smile on their face. How come, uh, how, how is, how has Twitter been, um, like, how do you guys use Twitter? Because I feel like you talk to a bunch of different founders and it's like, oh, Twitter, Twitter's not great for e-commerce. But then like I go to your, like you guys have, you do have a lot of activity. And then even in your Beard Brand social profile, it says uh, message at Banholtz to interact with the founder of Beard, Beard Brand. Like that's not there because, you know, you just wanted to put it there. Uh, yeah. So uh, Twitter's great. Like uh, Twitter's grown on me over the past uh uh, probably like a year. Uh, it's probably replaced Reddit as my favorite social media platform. And uh, it's how we got connected for this podcast as well. I, uh, I think I put the you know, tweet at Eric uh, just because <laughs> the Beard Brand Twitter account was probably pretty inactive. And, and uh, I think you, you kind of need like the, the people behind the brand. I, 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 we're getting better at the Beard Brand Twitter account. But I want to I want to say that's a shining example of of how good Twitter can be. But me personally, I feel like I've been able to really resonate on Twitter, and I've I've learned that to be successful on Twitter, it's like you gotta have conversations, you gotta interact with people, you know, you gotta like it, you just can't set up these bots that spam your your blog posts, and uh, you gotta reach out and have conversations, and you know, tell jokes and make statements, and 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 stand by those statements too. Would you ever have your copywriter just take get Twitter account and just write great stuff there all day? Nah, because one of the things he said when he started working for us is I don't want to be doing social media. So <laughs> he doesn't want to turn into like the Burger King Twitter handle, you know, just trying to come up with like memes all day. Yeah, yeah. He's more than more than uh, capable and competent of it. But I think he really enjoys longer form a little bit better. So uh, we let him have at it with the uh, email and, and our blog posts and then uh, product descriptions as well. Yeah. Like it seems from, from your Twitter, like you, you kind of have like, you're not ever, I mean, you're not always promoting your stuff. I think you talk more about like your, your story, you know, life as an entrepreneur, you know, not raising venture capital, uh, like how, you know, how just being an entrepreneur in this space. And that seems to, that seems to work well, as opposed to just like, Hey, here's a new product, try this new thing. Like it's not, it's not real. It's not often about your product. Yeah. What's interesting about, Twitter is like you end up getting a, if you make some tweets that end up going a little viral, then you start getting followers for that. And then it's kind of like this self-fulfilling prophecy. So like each of my social media platforms, they, they all kind of have like different content. Like I can post stuff about, you know, grooming and beard stuff on Twitter and no one gives a damn to be honest. Um, but I can talk about business, uh, which I love to do and it gets really good engagement. Uh, whereas if I go to, um, my Instagram account, um, I can post like these really cool, like modeling shots and no one gives a damn. But if I just post a selfie with a new haircut, they like, they flip out over it. And it's <laughs> like, you start to kind of learn, like the, the people who follow you on different platforms follow you for different reasons. And it's probably nice to be able to have like different mediums that, that are good for different things. Like Twitter's uh, really good for, you know, just interacting uh, with other entrepreneurs because we think so short, you know, term, I think. It's just a, a wonderful platform for that. 
how do you how do you make decisions on on scaling marketing channels and marketing stuff? Because you mentioned like in the early days, you kind of got to you kind of test into everything, but then you just make decisions on what you're going to kill and cut. Like, is there a is it a gut feeling? Is it a number? Like, how do you actually quantify which channels you should turn on or off? Yeah, yeah, we've we've cut a lot of things over the years. Um, for us, it, 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 I would say, especially in the early days, is is a gut feel. Um, and then you'll confirm it with, with data typically. Um, uh, when you're really small, you just like, you just have to, to go with what you see. And if you're involved, like if you're really connected to the brand, you know what, you know what's going on, you know what, what needs to happen. And then for us, it's been, um, the past year or two has been like, what do we do well? Okay, we're on YouTube, um, we do video ads, you know, we do social media okay, are we doing this to the best of our abilities? And the answer is usually no, right? So there's opportunity to get even better at the things we're doing. And then the question becomes, is getting better at YouTube or is getting better at Instagram going to be more beneficial to us than trying something completely new like podcast marketing or influencer marketing? And typically the answer is yes, it's going to be a lot more impactful to take a, a million um, follower YouTube channel to 2 million than it is to take, you know, like a TikTok from zero to 20,000 or, you know, Twitter from 12,000 to, you know, 30,000, something like that. So that's uh, the shift in thinking that we've had. And then the, the whole thought process is once we feel like we've totally, you know, kind of peaked out on our growth, then at that point, we'll look to, to integrate new uh, marketing channels into our strategy. This is a completely random thought, but do you, you have such high volume on your YouTube channel? Like you're generating probably pretty good income through YouTube. Like what do you, wh where does that go? Like, is that just reinvested in the business? Like how, how does that work at, from a business perspective? If you're not like a solo creator. Yeah. From just like the ads that we're getting. Yeah. 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 So uh, it pays for like the talent, uh, our video editor, um, uh, our team, uh, the personnel to go on there. And it's, it's pretty much in like the barbershops and the barbering. And there's a lot of in the equipment and the gear. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of expenses that, that go along with it. And it's generally pretty much like a break even unless we have a few vi videos that, that go viral. But Isn't that yeah. amazing? Hmm? Isn't that amazing? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're essentially like... <laughs> we're essentially getting paid or, or breaking even to have like all this free. Quote unquote, free yeah. Experience. Yeah. There's, there's no better hack in business than to, to have a successful YouTube channel. There's like no you, you bootstrapped your business, but it's like YouTube is almost bootstrapping your marketing. It's, it's insane. Okay. Wait, dive into that a little bit more. Like you, you think hands down YouTube would be the best platform. Yeah. 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 You're crazy. I mean, uh, I've been saying this for a long, long time uh, as a, a YouTube fan and going to a lot of events. It's like, everyone was like, how do you hack Facebook? How do I grow Facebook? How do I make money on Snapchat or TikTok or whatever it is? I'm like, dude, just <laughs> do YouTube. Like it's free. There's no platform that will like organically grow your channel. Like we're not paying anything to, to grow our channel. YouTube's doing that for us. And then like you build like authenticity and like a unique connection with your audience. And uh, it's hard for other people. Like no one can rip me off. There's only one of me. Um, people have tried, people have tried, but um, yeah, there's just so many reasons to be on YouTube, um, but people um, aren't willing. It's hard work. Yeah. And you gotta be willing to like suck at YouTube for one or two years to, to see the fruits of the labor. So most people aren't willing to, invest that kind of um, investment into it to see the results. During that like one or two years of sucking, did you have like a mental like, hey, I'm going to publish three times a week, no matter what, and just whatever happens? Like, did you have some type of guardrail for yourself to commit to it? Yeah. So uh, I think um, I don't have all the stats in front of me, but I think like that first year, 2012, before we launched the e-commerce business, we had like, I don't know, maybe like six to 12 videos, something like that. Uh, there's no strategy at all, um, but fortunately, one of those videos went went viral. Uh, we got like, you know, for a channel of 100 subscribers, we had, you know, like 100,000 views or something like that. So it was it was a good indication of what type of content would resonate with our audience. So 
then we started to learn that content and produce more and more of it. And we were able to, to continue to grow and, and get traction. But the goal is always like, especially in those early days when you're bootstrapped and you're, you're doing your own marketing, you're doing your own fulfillment, you're doing your own uh, operations and product buying. Like you're just, you're just trying to like pull all your shit together and like just get it done. So like to a certain degree, you don't have any strategy of like, oh yeah, I want to post this time, this time. Um, but as we were able to bring in more resources to help with operations and customer service, then that allowed me to put more strategy into it. And the big strategy change was probably like, I think it was like June of 2017 when we went up to daily content on the YouTube channel. And that really it put a hockey curve, a growth trajectory to our channel um, based on what the YouTube algorithm was doing back then. So it's... Um, it's always like a learning experience. And then of course, utilizing the resources that you have. So I'm sending quotes in Slack to the team as I do this. It also helps with notes. And then um, Connor just messaged me back and he said, he started with he started with $30, right? That's insane. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, like, what do you even do? What do you even do with $30? Like, why don't you just tell people zero? <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, pretty much. So I'll tell you like the, 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 the the exact thing that happened was I, uh, I had a blog uh, already established, uh, like a Tumblr page and a uh, uh, YouTube page. And then um, I had a contact with that, that, that manufacturer of grooming products. So I called them up and I said, hey, we're going to make an e-commerce store. And uh, can I buy some products? And he's like, yeah, that's cool. So I committed to buying a hundred dollars worth of products from him. And between the time that I made that commitment, I bought um, my Shopify subscription for like 30 bucks a month. And then uh, the, the, the article, I was quoted in an article in New York times. And then we got like, you know, $200 worth of sales and he was actually drop shipping for us. So he fulfilled the orders and then, you know, we paid him for, for all that. And then eventually we made like that order. And uh, over the course of, you know, that first year, uh, my business partners put in um, a total of $8,000 uh, to, to buy, you know, buy into the business, but it wasn't necessarily money we needed. Uh, so we did end up putting a little more money into the business, but I wouldn't even say we, we needed that money. Have you made any big marketing mistakes? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, that's all uh, business is, is just like making mistakes and, and learning from them. Um, you know, it depends how high level you want to go, but I, I feel like um, product selection was a big, big market research miss, like not having the right, right product offering. Um, I think in the early days, really the biggest mistakes that we were making, which is probably going to be more relevant to the listeners, was just really trusting um, the attribution from the various providers like AdRoll and Facebook. And, you know, like when we looked at Google and AdRoll and um, Criterio and uh, Facebook, you know, we were doing like, I don't know, like $500,000 in sales. And then we look at our sales and we're doing like a fifth of that. And it's like, okay, something's not, you know, you're just getting, everyone's taking credit for the same sale. And I'm sure they had a part of it, um, but attribution's kind of been, a, a challenging thing for us to, to learn. Can you can't have a conversation. I'm just smiling because for me, I've been in B2B. You've been entrepreneur in e-commerce. You can't have a conversation with anybody about any business and any marketing and spending on any marketing without having some type of a attribution frustration. Yeah. And I, I think we've, um, you know, Taylor holiday, another Twitter guy, uh, really is uh, a smart guy. Um, I picked up a few things from him and what we started to do is essentially we're only doing marketing to people who have not bought from your brand. So like all of our marketing now is um, um, to new clients. So we're able to feel more confident with our attribution model. Um, ah, that's, I like that. That's really, that's simple. Cause it's like, if you turn off all those other audiences, then you're not constantly, well, well, what's the, What's, isn't there pushback about like, well, no, Eric, you know, shouldn't you be remarketing to people to, you know, get, you know, drive repeat purchases or is the thought like that gets done through email? Yeah, that gets done through email. Um, yeah. So your, your paid marketing is your, your customer acquisition. And then 
with exception, I mean, maybe there might be exceptions where if you have like a new product launch, you'll blast it out to the email for a few times. And then, you know, after two or three days where you captured all that you could from email marketing, then you do like a Facebook campaign or something like that, but on very like specific limited type of marketing campaigns, but across the board. And I think that was our problem was we would always have this great return on ad spend you know, it's always like 5X or 10X or whatever it is, but the company's not growing. And it's just like, you're essentially um, eroding margin to capture customers that you already had. I love that. Taylor, Taylor's like, I'll watch a video clip from him and he's like, cat, row at, just spinning out all these things. I'm like, oh my God, I slow this down. But he, he's definitely- a quarter quarter speed to, to pick it all up. No, but like that's he he's actually a lesson in good marketing, which is like they are not trying to be all things marketing. That's like his niche is is advertising, right? And if you want to get better at advertising, like you should go, you know, watch his stuff. Yeah, yeah. Common threads project and they even have like a, a community where you can get in there and kind of like self educate. I forget what the community is called though. Are you are you involved in ads or you're just talking about like from an overall business strategy? Like you got to have somebody that's running the ad account day to day. Yeah. So, um, about, a, I would say about six months ago, we decided to bring our ad strategy in house. So we were working with a third party firm. It was a great fir- firm and, and I, 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 I like him, Nick with Ecomly. If you need an outside firm, uh, I would recommend him. Uh, I'd recommend Taylor too. I think they're, they're great people. Um, but we saw that our competitive advantage is really our content creation and we are outsourcing something that we we're really good at. So by bringing it in house, it gave us more abilities to create content quicker and have that ownership over it. And especially with the shift in like leveraging the, the, the algorithms ability to target the right demographics. So, uh, that's been, a uh, a process for us. We have a, um, uh, someone we call them like a growth marketer or uh, who heads it up. And then we have like a advertising coordinator who does a lot of the management of our ads in house. So it's a two person team and then I'll help with uh, content creation. So I'm, I, I'm like the voice or the face of a lot of the ads and able to cr- crank things out, but it's not just me. We'll, we'll, we'll tap anyone on the shoulder in the beard ring office. If they have hair or beard, we're like, all right, it's your turn to do a video uh, for our Instagram page. So a lot of our models are just beard brand employees. Yeah. I was, I mean, I was going to say everything looks real and that's, that's like, I don't know if you've read, have you ever read let my people go surfing by, uh, from Patagonia. So it's, it's great. He talks about basically all of their, all of the creative in their ads. It's never stock photos. It's either, uh, actual customers or people from inside the company. And it's just always given their brand like that real feeling. And I think that's, if you go to your, whether you go, whether you do, you go to your, your YouTube channel, your Instagram or your site, those all feel like real people. There's a lot of people that look like you. I can't, I can't tell you, you kind of all have a similar look. I, I can't really tell which one is you. It, uh, it's funny you say that because we did uh, this one professional shoot where we brought in this like freaking all-star photographer and she had a light assistant and, and like when she did the photos, she like touched them up a little bit and I'm like, this is not beard brand. It's like too polished. <laughs> like it's okay to have, you know, like, you know, zits on your face or like moles or, you know, like a little bit harsh light, you know, it doesn't have to be so soft. And so it was, it, you have to do that to realize that it's not exactly on brand, but. Sure. Um, All right. We're, we're going to wrap up. Um, I'm not going to ask you the best campaign thing. This was a good interview. I'm happy with it. Uh, but I do want to ask just where do you guys do disc? Like what's your frame of mind on, on discounts, um, offers? I know that's a typically a hot topic. You find people, people are either in or out. Where do you stand? Yeah. So there's discounting your products, uh, which we, we don't really do, but we, there are, um, promotions, which we do have. So uh, typically like a gift with purchase will be a common one that we have. Uh, Product launches is another one that we'll do. Limited edition um, products is another thing that we'll do. We just did um, a couple days ago, we did a a collaboration with Pit Viper. They make these badass like vintage glasses. They're the probably like the coolest brand because we have this uh, this comb here. It's we call it a, a 90s windbreaker. So it's got this like vintage vibe to it. So we paired that together and we created. Wait, this- 
You got to hold that up again. I didn't take a good enough screenshot. That's better. Cool. Um, yeah, so we called it the mullet kit. Uh, and we sold out of those in a day. Um, so there's things like that where you can bring excitement to your brand. And that goes back to like, how do you bring value to your audience rather than how do you just uh, degrade your brand to, to try to generate sales? So we're not a big believer in um, discounting our products or having like 25% off for Black Friday sales and stuff like that. Um, but we will, if, if you kit something together, uh, that kit price will be lower than the individual items. And then if you like get on subscription, you know, uh, we'll, we'll get rid of shipping costs and things like that. I like it. It also, is, it's just on brand. It's like, it seems like you're, pro when you do promotions, they're value added stuff. Yeah. And well, the thing is like, uh, for certain things, it makes sense. Like if you're an apparel company and you're never going to be making these pants again, yeah, knock them off 25%, 40%, 50%. But if you're selling a product that you're going to have for the next 10 years uh, and you discount it, you're just teaching your, your customers to expect that discount um, on whatever day. And they'll just, and you'll see it. Like you'll see like a, a, a drop in sales for what, it, like I bet you so many uh, e-commerce businesses see a huge drop in, in sales leading up to Cyber Monday and Black Friday. And then they talk about how they crushed it and killed it on those two days. I'm like, well, what was it like the week before? And like <laughs> our customers, they know there's no deal. So it's like they just, they buy whenever they're ready or whenever they need to. They don't wait for it. And that's a really, I never thought of it like that. Like if you, if you, if you were down 20%, the weeks leading up to it, and then after Black Friday, you're up 40%, are you, are you really up 40% or are you actually right where you would have been? Right. I, I don't know. Well, like people got to like, you know, shrug their egos however they are. And some people like really do kill it on that Black Friday, Cyber Monday. So I'm not poo-pooing anyone. Don't take it as that. And I, I obviously, we believe in our strategy, but the beauty of, of business is you can have lots of different strategies. So a pricing strategy, a discount strategy could be a great strategy for your business. So don't, don't rule it out, but there are advantages and disadvantages to it. All right. This will be my last question. And then I'm going to go play with my kids. They're right there. Um, you, you like, you gotta, you gotta pick one metric to, to prove that marketing works. Um, what, what is it? How do you make that case? I mean, for me, it's like return on ad spend. Um, if, if, for every dollar we spend, we make $2 and assuming the, the, their new customers, you know, I'll do that all day long. I'll spend a million dollars, $10 million doing that. And so, is that, is that, is that the simplest benchmark? Like two, two to one you're happy with? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, you know, if it gets too high, then, um, you know, you might not be scaling hard enough or growing fast enough and it gets too low. You're not going to be profitable or sustainable. I think every business is different. Um, but, but I would feel pretty happy if it, technically our, our number is 2.11. Um, if you want to get real specific, but, uh, two X return on ad spend uh, makes me a happy person. Cool. Eric, this was awesome. Um, fun thing for me doing these is I learn a lot. I got a million notes on my notebook and, and, in, and in Slack, just, uh, just talking to you. So, um, I appreciate it. I, I'm excited to keep following your journey and, and follow you on Twitter. Um, anybody that's not already following you can, can do so at Banholtz, which is H O L Z and uh, beardbrand.com. If you haven't checked it out uh, already, this was awesome. Thank you for doing it. Yeah, my pleasure. And I always tell any listener, like uh, one of the greatest hacks you can have is just go ahead and buy something for Beard Brand. Our products don't know if you have a Wang or a, a, a Wuha. What do they call it nowadays? I don't know. But um, yeah, so go ahead and do that. And you'll see our email flows. You'll see our packaging. You'll see the customer experience. And you'll be able to learn a lot about that process. <laughs> <laughs> that's the best hack. Hey, yeah, you want to learn how to do marketing, go and buy one of our products and you can see the funnel. Perfect. Yep. I love it. All right, Eric. Thanks for doing it. I'll see you later. <laughs>